Good morning! Today we're going to be going over mammalian blood. So our presentation is titled, Knowledge is Thicker Than Blood. Okay. Right now, flowing through your body is about 5 liters of blood, carrying around nutrients and helping get rid of wastes. To put that into perspective, that's 16 cups of blood in your body. That doesn't sound like a lot, but 16 cups of blood plays a really important role in your everyday life, as well as many other organisms. After many, many, many years of evolution, blood has evolved differently for different organisms depending on their needs. As humans and many other animals, we have red blood. But some organisms have developed different colored blood, including purple, blue, green, and even white blood. I'll pass it over to my partner Gabriel to teach you about some blood ancestry. Okay, so before we can get into blood and how it functions and what it does and where it goes and all that stuff, we have to figure out where it came from. So currently blood is known to have been around for quite a long time with the oldest fossil evidence dating back to around 500 million years ago in a species known as Morella splendens. So on the left side of this slide is a reconstructed image, reconstructed image of Morella, uh, which again is the oldest known organism to have any chemical evidence of blood in its fossils. So on the right, I know this image may seem a bit overwhelming, but maybe some of y'all have seen this before. So does anyone know what it is called or maybe what is what it is used for? Okay, so yeah, this is a phylogenetic tree, or you could call it a family tree, anything of that sort. So, and uh, it basically just compares evolutionary traits in an organism. Uh, so this could be either with an animal's appearance or using its DNA uh, with its genetic code. So the farther left on the tree represents distant ancestors and the right represents species closer to present day. The forks are branching out of the tree represent a, por a point where the species diverge to give rise to two species or two groups of species. So why I show you this tree is it is not only to give you all some exposure to it, but it also helps me in explaining the origins of blood. So the split between simple organisms, Cnidaria, who do not have blood, and every other living thing on Earth, <laughs> Bilateria, uh, may have happened uh, around 600 million years ago where you see Eumatozoa on this tree. It's highlighted in green for you. So this is where the first common ancestor of all living things with blood is believed to have split from simpler organisms who do not have blood. So with that being said, there's this pretty big gap of around 100 million years where the split is believed to have happened in Eumatozoa uh, to where the first evidence of blood appeared in the fossil record in the uh, Morella splendens. So Although this is this is the case, the, this split has yet to be soundly proven. There's not exactly any fossil evidence of this species, so we don't really know what it could have looked like. But we can guess about its appearance by looking at animals alive today that carry blood. So every animal alive today with blood have two things in common. They all have bilateral symmetry. So if you look at your hands and your face, this is why you have two eyes on each side of your face and not one eye on your butt. <laughs> so the other characteristic is an internal body cavity for support, which is basically just a way to support your internal organs so they won't slosh around in ways they're not supposed to. So the simplest animals today with these two characteristics are a coelomorphs, which are these flat green worm-like animals. Um, so with that in mind, our earliest blood having ancestors may have looked a lot like these guys. Of course, that's just speculation. And now I'll go ahead and hand it off to Elena. Okay, if you look down at your arm right now, you might be able to see some of your veins. Often they're bluish green or maybe even pinkish red. Your veins are where your blood passes through. It's how it gets from your heart to your lungs and brain and fingers, toes, and so on. If your body was a town, your blood would be the delivery man. He goes all around town, knows where everybody lives, and he delivers and carries important packages. One of these important packages is oxygen. This is one of the most commonly known packages that uh, your red blood cells will carry, and its best clients for oxygen are the lungs. On this page, between the party streamer mess and the bone, 
is an image of a typical human red blood cell. It looks a little bit like a donut except without a hole in the middle. This donut shape is called biconcave. Biconcave, the biconcave shape is what lets your blood cells flow smoothly through even the teeny tiniest of blood cells, uh, blood vessels, I'm sorry. Red blood cells are also a lot smaller than the other cells in your body. This is in part due to the fact that they do not contain DNA or any other organelles like your regular body cells. At this point, you might be wondering, wondering, well, where the heck do red blood cells even come from? Would anybody like to guess? Correct! <laughs> the answer is red bone marrow. In the bone marrow is where red blood cells' main component is formed. This one is a little bit challenging, but does anybody know what that protein is called? It's on this slide. It's the red party streamer mess. I'll give you a hint. It helps with carrying oxygen. Yes, it's called hemoglobin. Okay, after being produced in the bone marrow, they typically live around 120 days before they die and are replaced with new ones. Keep in mind though, red blood cells aren't the only component of blood. I'm gonna pass it over to my teammate, Caitlin, to go over the other types of blood cells and their important jobs in the body. I'm going to be talking about the functions of the main components in blood for mammals. Blood is a specialized fluid that has four main components to it. These components are plasma, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Plasma is a liquid that is the dominant component of the blood. It is a mixture of water, sugar, fat, protein, and salts. The plasma's job is to transport blood cells throughout your body along with nutrients, waste products, antibodies, and clotting proteins. These include red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Red blood cells are the most abundant type of cell in the body. Red blood cells contain a special protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin helps carry oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body and then returns carbon dioxide from the body to the lungs so it can be exhaled. Blood appears red because of the large number of red blood cells, which get their color from the hemoglobin. There are about 25 trillion red blood cells in the 5 liters of blood in the human body, which should carry up to 25 sextillion molecules of oxygen in the body at any time. The small size and large surface area of red blood cells allows for a rapid diffusion of oxygen and carbon. In the lungs, carbon dioxide is released and oxygen is taken in by the blood. In the tissues, oxygen is released from the blood and carbon dioxide is taken in for transport back to the lungs. Studies have found that hemoglobin also binds nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a dilator that relaxes the blood vessels and capillaries that helps with gas exchange and the passage of red blood cells through narrow blood vessels. White blood cells protect the body from infection. They are much fewer in number than red blood cells, accounting for only about 1% of the blood. White blood cells are primarily involved in immune response to identify and target pathogens, such as invading bacteria, viruses, and other foreign organisms. The most common type of white blood cell is the neutrophil, which can be considered the immediate response cell. It accounts for about 55 to 70% of the total number of white blood cells. The other major type of white blood cell is called a lymphocyte, which is then broken into two main populations. The first are the T lymphocytes. This type of white blood cell helps regulate the function of other immune cells and directly attacks various infected cells and tumors. The second group of lymphocytes are the B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes make antibodies, which are proteins that specifically target bacteria, viruses, and other foreign materials. Platelets help the blood clotting process. They gather at the site of an injury and stick to the lining of the injured blood vessel. They then form a platform on which blood coagulation can occur. This results in the formation of something called a fibrin clot, which covers the wound and prevents blood from leaking out. Fibrin also forms in the initial scaffolding upon which new tissues form, thus promoting healing. Next, I'm going to talk about blood types. There are many different blood groups in the animal kingdom. In humans, blood occurs in four main groups resulting from the presence or absence of two different antigens. Antigens are surface markers on the outside of a red blood cell's membrane. These two antigens are called A and B. So if you have A antigen, then you are blood group A. If you have antigen B, then you are blood group B. If you have both antigens, then you are AB. And lastly, if you have neither antigen, then you have blood group O. Another important antigen on red blood cells is the rhesus antigen. If you have this antigen, then you would be considered rhesus positive. If not, 
then you would be considered rhesus negative. Because of this, most people have their blood groups described as A positive, A negative, B positive, etc. Canines have as many as 13 group systems that have been identified, but there are only six that are most recognized. Dogs can be classified as positive or negative for each DEA, which stands for dog urethrocyte antigen, urethrocyte meaning red blood cell. Horses have seven different red blood cell groups. Over 30 different factors have been identified for horses. The blood groups are named with an uppercase letter to denote the group and a lowercase letter to designate the antigen. There are a variable number of factors for each blood group. Okay, so now I'm, we're going to test your knowledge, make sure you're paying attention. So, first question, what are the blood types for humans? Yes, that's correct, those are the blood types for humans. Okay, now the next question when did blood first appear in the fossil record? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is correct. That is when blood first appeared on the fossil record. 500 million years ago. Okay, now on to the next question. What protein carries oxygen that is present in all cells? Yes, it is hemoglobin. Yes, you are very indeed absolutely correct. All right. That concludes our presentation.